very pleased to introduce our speaker for this hour. Christian Swenson teaches ethics and values in our philosophy and humanities department here at UVU um, and has also taught classes in comparative literature and the humanities. He's a graduate of Brigham Young University's Comparative Studies MA program and the title of his presentation is Edward Muybridge and the Carriage Crash that Started Cinema. Christian. We're, we're more audible now. That's great. I appreciate that. Is, isn't technology wonderful? Um, so here we go. The English-American photographer, Edward Moybridge, is famous for inventing the zoopraxiscope, an early motion picture device and an important precursor to cinema. This invention embodied a climax in the career of radical innovation. Moybridge, who trekked west to Gold Rush, California, who changed his name more than once and who murdered his wife's lover, had a radical transgressive character. He willingly and willfully violated the boundaries of nature, culture, and the body. Moybridge therefore excelled at what prospectors, engineers, and capitalists of the American West were all doing at the time. Stepping over the line dividing familiar from unfamiliar, dividing known from unknown, and leaving railroads and grid systems in their wake. In another sense though, Moybridge went beyond even these popular transgressions. He crossed a border that had never been crossed before, the one dividing space from time. By photographing a racehorse and dividing its movement into instants, by building a career of photographing animals and human beings in motion, and by assembling these photographs into a seamless picture of movement, Moybridge implied that time itself was something like space, something scientists could dissect and something merchants could sell. This view of time, I argue, arose from Moybridge's insecurity about movement, and this insecurity arose from his traumatic experience involving movement. In 1860, Moybridge was thrown from a runaway carriage, landed on his head, and experienced a brain injury. His desire to control motion, expressed the way out of control motion, violated his body and his mind. This out of control motion itself, I will argue, arose from a system that valued efficiency at the expense of safety. This fact makes the zoopraxiscope a link in a chain of speed, control, and violence that persists to this day. And we therefore have everything to learn from the life of this fantastic, overwhelming, transgressive man. Edward Moybridge was born Edward James Muggeridge in Kingston-upon-Thames in Surrey, England in 1830. His father, John Muggeridge, John Muggeridge was a merchant and he made a living dealing with grain, coal, and timber. The Thames could be seen from the back windows of the house and more distantly across it, Windsor Castle and Hampton Court Palace. History surrounded him. He witnessed it. In 1850, the coronation stone, an ancient sarsen stone block that commemorated the coronation of Anglo-Saxon kings was recovered in his hometown. On it, the name Edweird appears twice, and it was in response to this discovery that Edward became Edweird and Mugridge became Moigridge, not Moybridge, yet Moigridge. He changed it again. Though through this act he seemed to identify with his English heritage, he chose to leave his country not long after and immigrate west to an America electrified with antebellum pension and the news of gold in California. His first job in New York was as a commissioned merchant for the London Printing and Publishing Company. He would travel across most of the country to arrange the importation of unbound books from England and their sale in the United States. His career was one that confronted him with the length and the breadth of the country he found himself in. In 1855, he moved to its extreme end and became a San Francisco bookseller. There, he sold books on topics stretching from architecture to agriculture to a state that, although booming in population, was still very much at the edge of the world. His business was popular, and it attracted the literary crowd of the city. In this city, full of people coming to reinvent themselves and find their fortune, Moybridge found himself at a place of radical cultural change. And in many ways, he also found himself at a time of radical cultural change. Ever since the daguerreotype was introduced into America in 1839, photographers had sprung up across the country in selling near instantaneous true-to-life portraits. Electric telegraphy, which proliferated across the United States and Great Britain 
from the 1840s onward, enabled near instantaneous communication across wide distances. Railroads continued to be drawn across the frontier as the locomotives that used them approached speeds that seemed near instantaneous by contrast to earlier technologies. The world itself seemed to be getting smaller. A stock phrase of the day quipped about the annihilation of time and space. Ralph Waldo Emerson worried about a situation where, where railroads bind the whole world fast in one web, an hourly assimilation. Thank you. That would fail to preserve local peculiarities and hostilities. As the time it took to cross space shortened, the space we s crossed seemed to shrink. Before the railroad, of course, there were horses. In the 1850s, after California's population boomed, but before the transcontinental railroad ran continuously from one coast to the other, the demand for overland mail was fulfilled by various services on horseback and stagecoach on treacherous frontier roads. The Pony Express was one of them, and so was Butterfield Overland Mail, a stagecoach service that would carry mail and passengers from Tennessee and Missouri through Arkansas and what is now Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona to California and back. These routes, although fast, were dangerous. In particular, Butterfield Overland Mail, this is one of their stages, relied mostly on unbroken mules and mustangs, and these animals caused both deaths and injuries. Edward Moybridge was a casualty of the, later, of the latter kind. Bound ultimately for a voyage home to England from California, Moybridge embarked east on July 2nd, 1860 on an eastward bound uh, Butterfield Overland Mail stagecoach. Nearly three weeks later, due north of Fort Worth in the Oak Groves of Central Texas, an accident occurred. As the San Francisco Bulletin would later report it, quote, on leaving the stable, the driver cracked his whip and the horses immediately started on a run. When they arrived at the brow of the mountain, the brakes were applied but were found to be useless. In his effort to stop the horses, the driver drove out of the road and they came in collision with a tree, literally smashing the coach in pieces, killing one of the men by the name of Mackey, a drover from Cattsville, Missouri, who was on his return from California and injuring every other person on the stage to a greater or lesser extent. Moybridge woke up nine days later in a bed in Fort Smith, Arkansas, 180 miles away. As he describes the effects of his injuries, I had a scar on my head. I had double vision, saw two objects at once, had no sense of smell or taste, also had confused ideas. He was told about the accident by a fellow passenger. Though apparently he could not remember it, he tried to get, a get out of the boot of the stage by cutting through the canvas with a knife. But before he could succeed, the stage struck a stump and he was thrown out. A stagecoach like the one Moygridge traveled in was enclosed and cramped for its passengers. It enabled fast travel, but it did so by immobilizing the passenger. It let that passenger cross large spaces, but did so by cramming her into a very small space. A kind of metaphysical trade-off occurred. You got great power by experiencing great powerlessness. You traversed a wide space by limiting yourself to a narrow space. The stagecoach's relative rigidity permitted its relative mobility, and this inverse relationship is not unlike the one the human body experiences. It too has structure and mobility, and it too purchases movement at the cost of structure. The body can move because the brain doesn't. The body can move because the bone doesn't. A boundary marks the difference between the body and the world it moves through, between inside and outside, and this boundary parallels the walls and windows that stood between Moybridge and southwestern Red Rock. Freud defined trauma as a boundary violation, another word for transgression, and the trauma Moygridge experienced by careening from his stagecoach and landing headfirst on the ground was a violation of boundaries physiological, psychological, and vehicular. Moygridge's carriage split open, but so did his body and mind. The latter violations occurred because of the former. Moygridge was broken because he revo relied on his vehicle to protect him. Whatever we rely on for defense and motion, leaves us defenseless and motionless when it breaks. And Moygridge was confronted with humanity's powerlessness in both senses after the crash. Arthur Shimamura, a neurologist at the University of California, Berkeley, effectively argues that Moygridge suffered an injury to his orbitofrontal cortex. Damages to this region, familiar to neurologists, disrupts the control and regulation of emotions. According to Shimamura, this injury is common in the victims of severe car accidents. The impulsivity and lack of self-control it provoked certainly fits Moygridge, who would defy convention by inventing new media and who murdered the man his wife was having an affair with. In this case, the transgression, i.e. the boundary crossing, 
fact that it was Moybridge's trauma directly resulted in the transgressions he would initiate later in his life. It would be a mistake to read the effects of Moybridge's brain damage only in terms of impulsivity, however. Seeing two objects at once directly implicates a change in the relationship between the brain's two hemispheres. The left eye communicates information to the right hemisphere, and the right eye communicates with the left hemisphere. The brain hemispheres are asymmetrical, and to paraphrase neuroscientist and author Ian McGilchrist, have all the same functions but do those functions differently. Though this is an oversimplification of his point, McGilchrist argues that among other differences, the left hemisphere tends toward fixity and stasis, while the right hemisphere focuses on change and flow. If we look for evidence that Moybridge's accident caused him to reorient the way fixity and stasis are related to change and flow in his world, we would find it. Skipping ahead to a later period of his life, we should remember that Moybridge, who would then be called Moybridge, was famous for inventing a medium that depicted movement. Although I will discuss this more later, the zoopraxiscope embodies an idiosyncratic view of the relationship between motion and motionlessness that perhaps articulates an idiosyncratic relationship between his brain hemispheres. It is also worth noting that not long after the accident, Moybridge would patent an improved method of an apparatus for plate printing, a device that would let the printer of books repeatedly print from engraved plates without having to wipe it clean first. By focusing less on books and more on the pictures they contained, by shifting away from the world of text to the world of images, Moybridge, Moybridge demonstrates both a unique perception of time and his first steps toward photography. After spending some time recovering from the accident, Moybridge arrived in New York City by the end of August 1860 at the latest. Yes. I like bogus stamps. Um, uh, let's see, where was I? Um, after spending some time recovering from the accident, Moybridge arrived in New York City by the end of August 1860 at the latest. Though he had plans to immediately return to California, Moybridge spent years abroad. After arriving in England, Moybridge became the patient of the eminent doctor William Gull, a physician to Queen Victoria, who would later save the Prince of Wales from typhoid fever, who prescribed him in the medical style of the time with vigorous outdoor exercise. Whatever occurred in those years initiated Moybridge's career shift. I argue, I argue as I have already implied, that this shift has to do with a new way of relating to time and representation that resulted from his accident, one that inverted the relationship between fixity and stasis, and that had everything to do with relationship, ownership, and names. Indeed, a few years af after a few years off the radar in the 1860s, Moygridge returned to San Francisco in 1867 and gave himself two new names. Moygridge became Moybridge, and he immediately began a new career in landscape photography under the gnome de plume Helios. His medium was stereography, a technique of taking two slightly spaced photographs in a way that when presented to each human eye with a special device, simulated depth. His subjects were the vast outdoor spaces of California's wilderness and specifically Yosemite Valley, a place that Moybridge was one of the first to photograph. His photographs were of great precarious ephemeral things. The stere this stereograph of a waterfall, for instance, is an odd choice for a still medium, but still manages to convey its overpowering nature. Like both a waterfall and a stereograph, it leaps at the viewer. This and other photographs from this time period are an example of the tendency in his career we have already seen. The novel relationship between change and changelessness, a still representation of movement. Or, for instance, take this photograph. That's him, that's actually him on the, on the cliff right there. Um, it makes us feel like we want to jump out of our seats and it makes us desperately want him not to jump out of his. The contrast between the human and the inhuman shows itself. The limitation of the human body is made plain. It gives a feeling of helplessness, but therefore also of daring. Moybridge looks as if he's about to leap. It looks as if he doesn't care if he leaps or not. He's on this precipice, at this edge, teetering on a boundary that he might or might not step over. It's worth noting that this photograph in particular was a crucial piece of evidence in the murder trial he would later undergo. It was supposedly a sign of insanity. Other stereographs like this one blur the line between indoor and outdoor spaces. The cave opens up seamlessly into sky. 
trees lined the border between the enclosed and the exposed. One gets a feeling that Moybridge felt a pull into open, exposed spaces. This was, of course, his trauma, being ripped from an enclosed carriage and being thrown into a vast, moving, bright outdoors, one that violated not only the boundary of his vehicle, but the boundary of his body. It is as if, in these photographs, Moybridge is challenging nature as such, as if he's daring the world, the sun, or even God to strike him down. The Moybridge sitting on a cliff is a Moybridge claiming nature as his own. Moybridge's name as a photographer was Helios, the god of the sun in Greek mythology, and it would not be an exaggeration to say that Moybridge sought to replace the sun. The sun allows human sight but comes from without. Its movements order human rhythms likewise from outside, and the sun itself reaches us outdoors. The first kind of photography, invented by one Nisiphor Nips around 1822, was called heliography which literally meant sun writing. Moybridge, excuse me, who called his photography businesses Helios's flying studio, therefore implied that his photography was the sun. Look at the parallel drawn between the white circle of the sun and the dark circle of the, of the camera. Moybridge is implying that his flying studio, like the sun, can swing through the air and illuminate the landscape. The Greco-Roman story of Phaeton Helios' son, who careened with his father's sun chariot far higher and lower than he ought to have done, who ended up dying in a blaze of glory, comes immediately to mind. Moybridge would have known this story. He would apparently spend long nights reading classic literature, and this story is in the classic text, The Metamorphoses. He, too, was the victim of out-of-control horses, and Helios would also be the middle name of Moybridge's son, Laredo. The sun's movement and light, Moybridge felt, belonged to him like a name, a body, or a child. He was the sun. Lost entirely is any sense of human ability or inability. Lost is the awareness of what transcends human limits. Like Python, like Icarus, like all the hubristic heroes, gods, and titans of Greco-Roman mythology, Moybri Moybridge has transgressed his limits. He swung high, wings spread, soaring toward a consummation of fire and light. The sun, as a transcendent guarantor of perception, symbolizes human dependence on what it could not control. And so Moybridge's impulse to replace the sun through photographs symbolizes radical independence and radical control. Moybridge's trauma resulted from out-of-control movement, and he sought to master the movement that shattered his body and his mind. This shattering arose from horses, the beings that in the myth moved the sun. Horses were Moybridge's villain, a symbol of everything out of control, everything transcendent, everything broke, unbroken. Like the sun graced human beings with transcendent visions, horses have historically graced hu us with transcendent movement. They can run much faster than we can and can do it for longer. Through the horse, we rely on the strength of another living being and become part of a bigger whole. Horsemanship as a skill depends on an intelligent preverbal communication between rider and animal, one that respects boundaries and honors agency. Equine therapy relies on the horse's ability to attune itself to the ticks and anxieties we aren't aware we have. Attuning yourself to the horse is attuning yourself to yourself. The horse can be directed but not entirely controlled, and in this way it parallels the body. We are to the horses as we are to our embodied being, and we respect the body by respecting the horse. Moybridge, who was injured by wild, unbroken Mustangs, was thrown not just out of the stagecoach but out of his body. These animals, who were themselves violated and abused, violated and abused their drivers and riders. Moybridge, his fellow passengers, and the animals that drove them then were injured by a system that favored the reins of mastery and control over the attentive sympathy between embodied beings. It is then entirely predictable that the defining arc of Moybridge's career would be his complete photograph photographic mastery of the horse's movement. At the time, there was a debate about whether or not a running horse's hoofs ever left the ground. To the human eye, it appears that horses always leave at least one foot touching the earth, and so paintings of horses would depict gates that later photographs would show to be inaccurate, like this, for instance, which seems silly to us in retrospect, and also that. Leland Stanford, a successful industrialist and racehorse owner who was then the former governor of California, and would be a California senator, met Moybridge in 1872 and hired him to photograph his prize trotter, Occident, in motion so as to settle this question. 
There are debates about when precisely Muybridge succeeded in the task, but it's clear that sometime before the end of 1873, he had taken a clear photograph of the horse at full speed where the positions of all four legs were visible. The results were described in local newspapers, which reported that even though they had not seen the photographs themselves, which would not be published until 1877, they had been told about their existence. I should emphasize what an incredible feat this was. To create an instantaneous photograph meant having an exposure time of, as it says here, less than one thousandth of a second. And at the time, exposure could take up to half a minute. Incrementally improving photographic technology and photographic technique were necessary for this achievement. Better lenses and better chemical processes helped. The implications of this success are hard for modern viewers to comprehend. Motion was interrupted. Time stopped. Like the horses that pulled Helios's chariot, Occident hovered above the ground in a way that would have seemed uncanny and impossible. Like the telescope did for Galileo, these photographs served as better eyes than the eyes did. Around this time, Moybridge found success. Around the time Moybridge found success photographing horses, he also found success as a documentary photographer hired by the U.S. Army to record the war against the Modoc Native Americans in California. However, a tragedy also occurred for Moybridge around this time. He was married to one Flora Stone Moybridge, a much younger woman who found her husband distant emotionally and often literally. Or Edward was a workaholic devoted to his craft, prone to staying up all night reading classic literature and often drawn away by his photographic pursuits. Flora found relief and love outside her marriage with a charming local rascal named Harry Larkins, a British immigrant who claimed he fought with Garibaldi but almost certainly didn't. He had been arrested for fraud in Salt Lake City in 1871 and was later jailed in San Francisco for writing bad checks. Flora and Harry pursued their affair under Edward's nose. One day, however, the photographer discovered them embracing each other, and Moybridge, Moybridge said to Larkins that he would kill him if he ever contacted his wife again. However, they kept writing to each other, kept meeting each other in secret, and the son that was born to Flora in 1874, Floredo Helios Moybridge, might have been Larkins. A nurse for the Moybridges, Susan Smith, sued Moybridge for back pay around this time. The legal fight between them made it clear that there were letters between Flora and Larkins, and Moybridge demanded to see them. On October 17, 1874, the most important day of Moybridge's life, he was at Nurse Smith's house and discovered a photograph of his son that he had never seen. This is the exchange between Moybridge and Smith as he told the story in court testimony. He said with a start, who is this? I said, it is your baby. He said, I have never seen his picture before. Where did you get it and where was it taken? I said, your wife sent it to me from Oregon. It was taken at Rulofsen's. He turned over the picture and started turning red and pale and said, my God, what is this on the back of the picture in my wife's handwriting? Little Harry. He stamped on the floor and exhibited the wild ex wildest excitement. His picture in my wife's handwriting, Little Harry. He stamped on the floor and exhibit, no, excuse me. His appearance was that of a madman. He was haggard and pale, his eyes glassy. His lower jaw hung down, showed his teeth. He trembled from head to foot and gasped for breath. He was terrible to look at. He cried out, great God, tell me all. He came forward with his hand upraised. I said, I will tell you all. I thought he was insane and would kill me or himself if I did not. I then told him all I knew. Moybridge, a photographer and a pseudonym aficionado who thought he could control a thing through photography and names, found that photographs of names could just as easily signal the loss of control. The son bore not his name, but another's. What he thought was his was another's. His name for the child was not the child. Moybridge would show that photography could contradict the witness of our eyes. And now Moybridge knew this firsthand. Photography worked against the photographer. Representation revealed an uncomfortable reality. By nightfall, Moybridge was in a carriage bound for the Yellow Jacket mind. He had bloodshed on his mind. mind. Larkins was there, playing cribbage with friends. He asked who the silhouetted figure was, and he answered, my name is Moybridge, and I have a message to you from my wife. On the last syllable, he fired his revolver, and the bullet pierced Larkins below his left nipple. My name is Moybridge. I have a message for you from my wife. He gives his name first, the one that he gave himself, and the message, which was not his wife's, but his own, comes from his lips and his own gun. It's all about identity, all about control, all about ownership and mastery. The shot was a message, 
an act of naming, an act of declaring, one that blurred the difference between representation and reality, between words and events. This murder is not an exception to the course of Moybridge's life. It is a shining example of his character. For him, the artist's job was a violent one, to claim reality, to master it, to control it, to replace it. Aiming his gun like a camera, with an instantaneous flash, Moybridge shot Larkins like he'd shoot a scene. Moybridge was arrested, Larkins died, and the trial would occur. He tried to have the court consider him insane, had the court consider his brain injury and his eccentric photographs at Yosemite, but even though his plea didn't work, he was given a verdict of not guilty. The jury, apparently, all men, believed that they would do what Moybridge did under similar circumstances. He was set free. His, uh, that, that's frontier justice for you. you know. His wife divorced him and later died, and Laredo was sent to a series of orphanages where he would have little contact with his father. Moybridge spent some time during these years photographing a revolution in Central America. He also managed to create a photographic panorama of the San Francisco skyline. Stanford, however, was not done with Moybridge, and neither were his horses. He wanted the experiments with photography to be carried further, to photograph not just an instantaneous moment of a horse's movement, but a few of them in series. In 1878, on a plot of land in Palo Alto, where Stanford University would later sit, employed by that university's namesake, Moybridge would be busy developing other innovations. To photograph a horse in movement like this means having exposure times of about a thousandth of a second, and the position needed to be exact. Moreover, there was not just one, but 12 cameras at equidistant intervals. This rules out human dexterity. And instead, after building a long shed, like a carnival booth that would shelter the cameras, he designed a system where threads, broken by the horse in its run, would trigger the movement of two boards. They would be pulled down by strong rubber bands across the camera's lens. The lens would start covered and end covered. When the threads released a latch, the rubber bands would pull down the boards with enough force that exposed that the exposed slot beneath the planks would line up with the lens only for the time required. It took trial and error, and Moybridge would improve this technique by using an electromagnet, but it worked. On June 11, 1878, with reporters present, one horse pulled a carriage, another horse ran, the running was photographed by Moybridge's apparatus, and these photographs were developed to the awe of those present. One declared that this exhibition was a brilliant success. His labors had no precedent. The San Francisco Morning Call wondered at how all previous notions are dispelled, and what was thought to be the more simple is the more complex. Eyewitness is perhaps not the best witness. The body itself was perhaps becoming obsolete. Here are the pictures. This is the one with the carriage. This is the one that's running. And here it is animated, as you can see, the first motion picture ever. Um, Horses, so close at hand, now seemed alien and strange, their limbs bent in impossible contortions. But these movements were apparently very common and even ever-present. What else they thought might what else they might have thought was different than it looked? What other grotesque things were closer to us than our jugular vein? What veils, like shutters, still obscure our eyes? Looking at these stills, the viewer became like Moybridge thrown out of his carriage. Cast out of our normal perception, seeing life from an alien perspective, the world looks stranger and less stable than it always had. Indeed, in many ways, we are spectators to a Moybridge working out his own baggage. He sought to master the horse's movement through representation. In the horse in motion, after all, there is no motion. All the horses there are still, frozen, dead. He has killed what sought to kill him. He has made movement motionless. Moybridge has taken back the reins. He published these photographs, together with the single 1873 image of Occident trotting at high speed in 1878 as a series of cabinet cards called The Horse in Motion. These photographs caused a stir and catapulted Moybridge to celebrity first at home and then abroad. The San Francisco Illustrated Wasp, for instance, published a caricature of these studies, where, as you can see, it's, it's, it's funny. You know, where uh, the horse's legs spin wildly akimbo. Moybridge began presenting these studies by lecture and portrayed the photographs by lantern slide. 
When these lectures waned in popularity, Moybridge began to churn with another idea. The zoetrope, a toy from much earlier in the century, was a rotating cylinder with images spaced in ways that they could trick the viewer into thinking she was witnessing real movement. This device and similar ones, for instance, the thomatrope, maybe you've seen that before, you twist it, and the phenakistoscope, relied on incremental instance of movement and, human, and the human being's ability to infer motion from a quick succession of stillnesses. These devices were philosophical toys, tools to demonstrate the fallibility of the human senses, parlor tricks. Moybridge in, Moybridge's innovation was to use his motion studies, combine them with both of these techniques and the magic lantern, and create a photographic simulation of movement fit for all to see. He called his new machine the zoogyroscope, but quickly changed it to the zoopraxiscope. And as you can see, here's one of the discs he used, and this is the device. He replaced the glass slide of the magic lantern with a pair of rotating discs, one with a series of images and another with open slots to work as a set of shutters. He demonstrated it for the first time in August, autumn 1879 at, Palo, at the Palo Alto house for him and some friends, for Stanford and some friends. His living room became the first movie theater ev ever. Every cinema, every cut, every shot, scene, and screen can trace its lineage to that night. There, in light and shadow, a ghostly horse galloped on the wall. The image floated free of its object. It moved. Moybridge had won. He, like the sun and its light, had brought life to what was dead. The horse severed into pieces. The horse severed into pieces, split into parts, was reintegrated and reanimated. He had all power. It seemed as if he held the reins of life and death in his hands. Light and darkness were under his thumb. The zoopraxiscope resembles another Z-O word, the zodiac, a name that literally means animal circle. It is as if Moybridge commanded a miniature cosmos with his own sun and stars. The audience at Moybridge's movie night for their part were delighted. There, they realized that the horse whose gait they photographed was not the horse they thought they photographed. The new medium could apparently verify human perception. Abroad, Moybridge's work was busy causing a crisis in the world of painting. While the more modern artists were sympathetic, the realist painters confronted the fact that their paintings of certain subjects may not have been very realistic. The painter Jean-Louis Ernest Messonnier, renowned for his realistic paintings of horses, wept when Leland Stanford show him, showed him Moybridge's photographs. All these years, my eyes had deceived me, he said to Stanford. After 30 years, of absorbing and concentrated study, I find I have been wrong. Never again shall I touch a brush. The sculptor Auguste Rodin would later critique Moybridge's vision of life, on the other hand, by saying that it is the artist who tells the truth and photography that lies, for in reality, time does not stop. In 1881, Moybridge set off for Europe to represent, excuse me, Moybridge set off for Europe to present his work to another continent. Moybridge had begun a correspondence with Etienne Jules Marais, an inventor who guided him in the foreign country. He presented the zoopraxiscope to crowds that included Alexandre Dumas fils, son of the famous author. Messonnier, the painter, was there too. In 1882, he moved on to England, where he lectured at the Royal Institution, where the Prince of Wales and future King Edward VII was in the audience. While there, however, Moybridge was to encounter more legal troubles. Stanford had uh, asked a friend and horseman, Dr. J.B.B. Stillman, to write a book analyzing his motion studies. It was published in February 1882, and treacherously, it failed to acknowledge any contribution from Moybridge. This omission caused the Royal Society of Arts to withdraw its offer to fund his studies in motion photography. Moybridge, crushed, had to sell the original copies of the horses, horse in motion to return to America, and there he launched legal challenges against the violation of his copyright. The lawsuit was dismissed out of court, but in a way it didn't matter. Moybridge was astir with realizing one of his biggest ideas ever. In March 1883, Moybridge published a prospectus for the attitudes of man, the horse, and other animals in motion, a collection of photographs of men, horses, dogs, oxen, and other domesticated wild animals executing various movements at different rates of speed. Though he no longer had Stanford as a patron, he negotiated with the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to sponsor the project. There, 
with a fence and trap set up not unlike the one in Palo Alto, with more precise shutter mechanisms, he began his enormous project. Many, with the sub many of the subjects were people, athletes from the university, teenage boys and young women, old women, women with multiple sclerosis. Most of the subjects were partially or entirely nude. Others were animals, cats, dogs, goats, ostriches, camels. Even big cats like tigers and lions made appearances, as you can see. Here's some of them, as you can see, animated into movement. Over two years and about 20,000 photographs, he compiled the work that would appear as his 1887 work, Animal Locomotion. It was his masterpiece. Cats pounced and camels sauntered. Men ran and women danced. The photographs reinforce the casual sexism of a Victorian milieu, but they are all incredibly embodied. Animals and human beings share space. Naked as the day they came, in Darwin's wake, the human beings seem animal. Lumps and bumps and bulges abound. The zoo and zoopraxis scope is made plain. Moybridge is a Noah building an ark. Apes and birds and big cats share space in its pages. A zoological catalog, a compendium of movement, a microcosm of the world. After the publication of Animal Locomotion, less a book and more a collection of images, Moybridge would continue to lecture in the United States and Great Britain, but began to slow down. By the turn of the century, he had published two more books with the negatives he had kept, Animals in Motion and The Human Figure in Motion. And as eventually he found himself in Great Britain without the intention of ever returning to the United States. He died on May 8th, 1904 in his hometown where his body was cremated and his ashes interred in a grave. There, in a perverse ironic parallel with the coronation monument that gave him his name, his name was misspelled. Moybridge's life had a logic to it. There was a method to the madness of his biography. As I have alluded to, it was all about representation, identity, naming, and ownership. A few themes, however, deserve more elaboration, and the first is his philosophy of time. The relationship of time to space has caused no shortage of controversy throughout history. St. Augustine asserted that God existed outside of time, and therefore insisted that time was ultimately spatial, and that God stood motionless outside of it. H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, published in 1895, one of the first time travel stories relied on spatial metaphors for time. The main character travels through time, and like travel through space, this movement is reversible. Time travelers, however, rarely travel through the time it takes to travel through time. When, to quote Wagner's 1882 opera Parsifal, time turns into space, we have no time left to explore that space. We are as stuck and still as Augustine's God. Moybridge, like Augustine and Wagner, posits a time thought of as a kind of space. Time is just one picture next to another picture. Movement is just a set of motionless instants. Change is just changelessness. Time is an illusion. There is nothing new. The future is already there, ready-made. We are stuck, frozen, paralyzed like the moviegoer with their popcorn and Coke. Contrast this vision to that of Abraham Joshua Heschel in his book, The Sabbath its meaning for modern man. Every one of us occupies a position in space. He takes it up exclusively. The portion of space which my body occupies is taken up by myself in exclusion to anyone else. Yet no one possesses time. There is no moment we possess exclusively. This very moment belongs to all living men as it belongs to me. We share time, we own space. Through my ownership of space, I am a rival to all other beings. Through my living in time, I am a contemporary with all other beings. However, Moybridge longed to own both space and time. The medium he invented confuses the two. Like a newly discovered continent, Moybridge opened up time to colonists and capitalists. What you own, you can sell. What you own, you can manipulate. The shots and cuts of cinema, the medium Moybridge germinated, give us the illusion of a view from all angles at once, the dizziness of the God's eye view, the fantasy of omnipresence and omniscience. In the cinema seat, we become like Helios and like Augustine's God. We, utterly still, sit outside of time and watch as it passes by. Helios, moreover, deserves more attention as an image. In Greek and Roman myth, this figure turned day into night and night into day. This rhythm between light and darkness is the instantaneous rhythm 
of the Zurich Praxiscope and the flickering cinema. And of the light switch, for instance. An author with autism, Tito Rudrashima Kropadye, wrote in his memoir, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move, that turning the light switch on and off really fast was, quote, as if he were holding the reins of bright and dark moments in his hand. He sees the instantaneous rhythm of light and dark on and off as a kind of horsemanship. Moybridge, like the artist, was overwhelmed by movement and sought to order it by dividing light from darkness in biblical fashion. Moybridge thought he could hold day and night under reins. His photographic pursuits were an attempt to surmount the chaotic flux of movement, time, and trauma he experienced thrown out of the Butterfield Overland stage. He wanted to play God. He wanted cosmic stillness. He wanted divine rest. But that is arrogance, and such arrogance rarely ends well. The world Moybridge left behind for us with screens not just in our theaters, but in our houses and in our pockets is louder, more chaotic, and more mobile than ever. We can't escape it. Though we are more static, still, and stuck than our ancestors had ever been, we are restless. Every notification, every pop, ding, buzz, every red bubble, every text, every update, every newsflash, every match, it all announces a world that no longer under our control controls us. Your phone, a mini zoopraxiscope, a mobile moving picture, has mastered you as thoroughly as Moybridge mastered the horse in motion. We are overwhelmed by what we thought was ours. We are Python, and our world aflame, we have realized that we are not the sun. The short story author Jorge Luis Borges described a country so obsessed with map making that re they designed a map so detailed it coincided with the country it depicted. Pieces of that map, rendered obsolete by the country they couldn't replace, molder in the desert. Representation is not reality. Life transcends our pictures of it. If we do not look beyond our photographs to the life we thought they captured, if we don't peer at it above our phones, that life will build until it overwhelms us. The world is awful and wonderful. It is overwhelming. And if we don't confront its majesty with wonder and humility, we will burn in a world we find we can't control. All right. Thank you, Christian. That was fantastic. Um, we've got a little bit of time for some questions. Would anybody uh, like to ask any questions? I'll turn this mic around and hand it to you. I know. Is this on? Hello? I know that uh, Edison made something called a kinetograph camera. He was influenced by Moybridge. Like uh, that was my question. Yeah, yeah. he was. Uh -huh. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love his beard, by the way. It's the best beard I've, I've seen all day, actually. And I don't think he has much competition as far as my beard goes. Anyway. Um. Um, if, if others feel the way I do, the reason that no questions are being answered is because that was really such a beautiful and finely crafted presentation. Thank you. So most important, just to say thank you for the time and thought that you put into that. It was just a pleasure to listen to. I guess I'll try and break the ice by just saying that I'm, I'm super interested in the theme that you and that Moybridge touch on of the lie that is photography, yeah. the, the way that the illusion, the way that it seems to offer us the stoppage of time. It seems to offer us yeah. immortality when in fact it only emphasizes our mortality. It only winds up emphasizing the fact that we cannot control time. It only emphasizes our vulnerability when it seemed to offer us control. I mean, that's what technology does, right? What happens when your car stops working? You're much more vulnerable than before you got a car. <laughs> yes, and yes. I, I will admit, I, this presentation was influenced by a car crash I got into last November. That's where this came from. I yeah. Understand. I had well, an intuition. I Go ahead. Uh, no, I just wanted to let you know, that if you haven't investigated the work of uh, the artist uh, Francis Bacon, you yeah. ought to, because he... Is, is this the different from the Francis Bacon? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's not the not, not the the English. Uh, th th this is this is Francis Bacon, well, though he is English, but um, more contemporary, m more modern. He he um, he seems to respond to the Rodin observation that you read, where mm. Rodin distinguishes art and says Ar artists are telling the truth and photographers are lying because we can't stop time. But but um, Bacon paints photographs. So he stays within the tension and and re and really just meditates upon the lack of control that we have. I think it's also a, it's not just a lack of control, but it's an influence to people controlling us. Um, I wrote this. I mean, I was then thinking about the metaverse too, and thinking about the pervasive influence of social media and the fact that what we think is going to replace the world just isolates us from it, and. I think about the fact that our phones seem immaterial and ghostly, but they actually were made by human life. I, I, I try to, I, on my phone, I have a picture of someone working, a child working in a pump of minerals in Africa, Africa to remind me that this isn't a toy. Um, in that sense, there's, this isn't just an illusion. It isn't like an invoke in reality. This is, this has roots. And every photograph has root, is material. It doesn't just represent material. Every piece of art is grounded in earth and air and water and metal. Well, that was delightful. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Moybridge is one of the big daddies, don't you? Uh, he looks like a big daddy, doesn't oh, he? Oh, he's one of the big daddies. Yeah, he, everybody agrees. He's, a, he's the biggest daddy. Well, yeah. I don't know about the biggest, but he's a big daddy. Yeah. So I want to be a big daddy uh, what, what is his, uh, could you give us an authoritative uh, pronunciation of his first name? I usually pronounce it Ayerbriarwyrd. I'm going to let it be ambiguous because I think he'd well, want that. Well, that's clear. I don't want to be clear. No, just kidding. Um, uh, <laughs> so be ambiguous then. I'll be. I'll. I'll be. I'll be confidently ambiguous. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to say Eid weird. I'm going to say that. E weird. I, Eid I like weird. That. I like it too. I really like e it. Eid weird. I like you too. Isn't that Eid great? weird. I like it. Yeah. All right. All right. That, that for me that yeah I came close to it. He's Alex Caldera, by the way. He's my hero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate. it. All right, going once, going twice. Yes, please. Uh, do you feel like inventions like this that represent a paradigm shift in, in the human approach to art and reality and so forth, um, do you feel that it's inevitable? For example, like if, if Moorbridge had not discovered the zoopraxiscope, do you feel like that discovery was inevitable as a step that humanity would take or that it's contingent upon this man. I didn't talk about it. this, but I think it would have eventually happened. I think it would have happened through someone as messed up as he was, though, honestly. Um, I think that the, pr the pr I, I believe in an arc in of human history, but I don't believe it's a good one. I think that we are getting progressively alienated from our roots and the embodied being in the world that used to be our birthright. And... Uh, I feel like in this time, this, this happened around the time when transcontinental railroad was being built and completed. You know, a lot all those technologies I described, you know, automobiles I didn't talk about were developing around this time. Cars and trains were kind of TV, you know, with a windshield. Uh, but I think that the more history progresses, the more powerful our technology gets, and the more we rely on them and, as and assume that what we use to navigate life is life. But it isn't. It isn't. No, it isn't. All right, I'm going to paraphrase a question from online uh, from Michela. Uh, she asked, she talked about Maybridge being this great character. Where do you, and she asked where your own reading of Maybridge breaks new ground. Where my own Moy reading of Maybridge breaks new ground? I think it's, I haven't heard anyone talk about how his trauma is connected with the specific medium he invented. People talk about the way his trauma, uh, people talk about the way his trauma made him more inventive. People don't talk about the way that 
his trauma uh, affected the way he perceived the world so that he invented an, a new way of perceiving the world. And, you know, I, I didn't have time to include this in my presentation, but I think he's very similar to Jorge Luis Borges in that sense. Mor Borges, the author, had a brain injury early in his life, and that immediately precipitated a new change in writing style. He called it games of time and infinity. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's playing games of time and infinity because of some relationship between his brain hemispheres, is what I'd say, yeah. Fantastic, and uh, I thought it was great that you showed that he conquered the horse in the end. Yeah, uh, the end. poor horse though, right? right. Yeah, I, I, I feel bad for the horse. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I guess he's great too. Yeah. That was brilliant. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming to our 11th Annual Humanities Symposium. Um, please review the recordings if you would like to and talk to your instructor about a possible humanities major or minor. I highly recommend it. Thank you very much.